Today I'll be presenting on contingency management for substance use disorders. Uh, our objectives are that by the end of the presentation, you'll understand the foundational principles of contingency management. We'll explore together the effectiveness of contingency management in treating substance use disorders, and we'll discuss the implementation challenges and considerations associated with contingency management. So this is very much just an introductory level, a uh, big picture view of contingency management uh, for those of you who haven't heard or who are interested. Uh, so let's start out with the what and the why. Uh, contingency management is an evidence-based behavioral treatment for substance use disorders, uh, including uh, also many other disorders. Encourage, it encourages positive behavior change through the use of concrete reinforcers to increase motivation. And just for the purpose of this presentation, uh, to simplify things, uh, just you can think of a reinforcer as a reward, as something that patients are willing to work towards. Uh, CM can be combined with other behavioral treatments uh, very easily, actually, and that can help to promote broader recovery skill building alongside the target behavior uh, that's targeted in CM. And uh, the why is that CM is especially effective for stimulant use disorder, including comorbid opioid use disorder. And as many of you probably know, we do not currently have any FDA approved medication for stimulant use disorder. All of the other psychotherapy approaches besides CM have comparatively much lower efficacy. And unfortunately, uh, recently here in New Mexico, as well as the US in general, stimulants are increasingly implicated in overdose deaths. Uh, so this is very timely. Uh, we wanna make sure people know about CM and um, have access to it if they can. Uh, so we'll start with some of the, the foundational principles of operant conditioning, which actually come from research dating back to uh, the 1930s. If you've taken an intro to psych class, you've probably heard about B.F. Skinner and all of the interesting things he did with pigeons and rats. Uh, his, his most famous finding had to do with the fact that specific consequences can shape voluntary behaviors. And the simplest way to break this down is just to say that behavior that's rewarded is more likely to reoccur and behavior that's punished is less likely to reoccur. I know that sounds really simple, uh, but it actually has pretty far-reaching implications. And during the 30s, this was a real fork in the path of, in the field of psychology. So the way that he applied this, uh, and that's most relevant to what we're talking about today, is that he chained together multiple simple behaviors by using rewards and punishments uh, in order to add up to complex behaviors. Uh, some of them were really very impressive. So he started out with things like having pigeons, you know, peck a light when it turned green, or to have a rat pull a lever at a certain time. And then he was able to build up from that, um, and then they were rewarded for that behavior with food usually. Uh, and then he added those together to accomplish complex behaviors like pigeons playing ping pong, which is one of the most uh, memorable <laughs> ones that came out of his lab. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where it started. And then I'll, I'll take you on a little tour through the timeline uh, of how operant conditioning sort of became contingency management. And with this particular approach, I do think the historical context is important, uh, both to understand how long this research has been around and how refined it has become through its different iterations, but also to to understand the sort of political context uh, that we're approaching contingency management in today. Uh, so moving on from that operant conditioning series of experiments, uh, uh, Skinner applied those principles in the 1950s to a clinical population where he used what's called a token economy where uh, health promoting behaviors could be uh, sort of exchanged for tokens that in turn were exchanged for desirable goods. So that could be things like medication adherence or good hygiene uh, could be exchanged for special privileges or desired foods or things like that. Uh, in the 1960s, the addiction medicine field was increasingly understanding the critical role of positive reinforcement in maintaining addiction. And so that in turn uh, led to implementation of operant conditioning principles specifically to reinforce abstinence, as well as to encourage behaviors that competed directly with substance use. Uh, and this was, this was seen earliest at uh, the me methadone studies at Rockefeller University, where they began informally incorporating positive reinforcement. Uh, and I'll return to this later because one of the things that came out of this series of uh, first informal efforts and then studies uh, was them finding that it was actually really important to ensconce contingency management within a general culture of reinforcement and affirmation. So that means a sort of unconditional positive regard extended towards the patient, this idea that reinforcing them in multiple ways uh, led to positive outcomes. Uh, in the 1970s at John Hopkins, uh, researchers applied these same principles to alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorders and found that this approach improved retention, attendance, abstinence, and importantly, again, those behaviors that compete directly with substance use. 
more recently in the 80s and 90s, the crack cocaine epidemic in the US uh, spurred very urgent research into more effective treatment for stimulant use disorder. And that's where the first formal voucher-based system uh, came about. Uh, so that was where patients could exchange essentially negative UDS tests, uh, urine drug screen tests uh, for vouchers. And this was combined with a, an adapted version of the psychosocial treatment community reinforcement approach or CRA. Uh, more recently in the 2000s, the, the Motivational Incentives to Enhance Drug Abuse Recovery or MIDAR study, which was, I think it was about 800 patients over two sites. And this was the study that was part of the National Institute of Drug Abuse's uh, clinical trial network. Uh, this explored ways to reduce costs uh, in delivering these incentives because that's a very significant concern for organizations. And this is where a technique that we'll go over in a bit called the fishbowl technique using intermittent reinforcement uh, they found that this really actually improved outcomes while also lowering costs. So that was, this was a really big breakthrough in terms of making this more accessible uh, to a variety of organizations. Some of the other findings from this study, which was by far the largest of its kind at the time, uh, were that incentives improve patient retention, they improve patient outcomes, and that even these significantly lower cost incentives improve stimulant abstinence for patients that were in the methadone maintenance treatment. Uh, importantly, the cost of incentives here averaged 120 per participant over three months, and this was about a third of what the average cost was at the time per patient. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to shift now to a very, very simplified version of some of the underlying mechanisms that are at the uh, confluence of contingency management and substance use. Uh, so if, if you've heard anything about substance use, you've probably heard that dopamine is, is a key player uh, in learning and behavior and accordingly uh, reward and pleasure. Uh, so colloquially, uh, we often refer to the dopamine centers of the brain as reward centers. And when these areas are stimulated, that dramatically increases the likelihood that the behavior that's associated with the stimulation is going to reoccur. And it's important to note that substances are going to outcompete virtually any kind of reinforcer that you're going to find uh, in, in ordinary life. So it's really going to light up that reward center disproportionate to what the brain experiences in any other kind of everyday circumstance. Uh, something that I think is important to note when we think about how is it possible that people who have very severe substance use disorders seem to, uh, you know, pursue, pursue the substances at the expense of everything else that's important in their life, I think it helps to understand that the pathways that these substances operate on, these, these dopaminergic pathways, originally evolved to ensure our survival as a species. They're, they're that deeply canalized. So that has to do with, with feeding, with reproduction, really the fundamental activities of the survival of the species. And I think that helps explain how kind of atavistically urgent uh, the behaviors uh, can appear when people are seeking substances in distress. Uh, another important note is that these pathways are, are linked, or I should say, that the susceptibility uh, to these pathways being hijacked by substances, that's really exacerbated in conditions of... Um, so that idea is that if somebody grows up in a resource-poor environment, uh, whether that has to do with socioeconomic status or with uh, deficits in relational attachment, then they're particularly vulnerable uh, to having those pathways hijacked, essentially, by substance use. Uh, so this is part of... Uh, this is an important part of why people with substance use really struggle with motivation, uh, right? Because those the alternatives uh, in terms of reinforcement are very weak compared to are in, in reinforcing that brain pathway. Uh, so this goes back to, to what that re uh, researcher uh, with the early methadone studies at Rockefeller was, was discussing when he talked about the importance of creating a really warm and welcoming general culture of affirmation in the clinic, noting that uh, patients with chronic substance abuse, uh, they, they are essentially constantly in this sense of deprivation, state of deprivation, where their brain is really hungering for reinforcement much more than somebody who hasn't been dependent on substances. So this is where CM comes in because uh, contingency management offers that immediate tangible reward for healthy, sustainable, positive behaviors. And that can build a bridge from, from where people start out at very early in recovery, where they're really in uh, very extremely in that state of de deficit uh, to help them build the health promoting behaviors until they can get to the point where they are voluntarily engaging in these, what are what we call naturally occurring reinforcers, which are things like positive psychosocial relationships or meaningful work. And the idea there is just that 
it, it builds that bridge so that they're able to build up to it, despite the fact that um, initially their brain is just not going to respond strongly enough to a natural occurring re reinforcer because those things are much more abstract. You can't really count on it. It's kind of diffuse and off in the future. So that's why contingency management and those immediate rewards are really, really helpful for, for linking uh, you know, the early recovery behaviors to the later recovery behaviors. Uh, all right, in terms of uh, sort of foundational principles on the implementation side, uh, uh, important ideas to keep in mind are that behaviors that are reinforced rapidly and relevantly are likely to reoccur. Uh, so this is, is, again, just an extension of Skinner's work, and it's virtually ubiquitous in our society now. You can see this in everything from classroom behavior charts to, uh, you know, slot machines at casinos or dating apps. Um, you know, there, there's so many applications, uh, bonuses at work. Uh, so this is really a pretty ubiquitous principle, but it's especially uh, relevant to substances of abuse because as we've talked about, um, that, that very strong reinforcing effect that substances have and the need to be able to compete with that. Uh, so remembering that effective reinforcement, generally speaking, is positive, it's salient, meaning that it's relevant to that particular patient, it's meaningful to them. There's a lot of nuance there and, and we'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, in terms of the requirement, you wanna make sure that the target behavior is one that you can monitor accurately and frequently. So it needs to be something pretty concrete, something verifiable and something that happens often enough that the patient is gonna be able to be rewarded regularly uh, if they meet that target. Uh, and that's because you want to be able to apply those reinforcers as soon as possible after the behavior occurs in order for that learning to occur most effectively. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you remove that reinforcer if the target behavior does not occur. So let's look at different types of reversers and how they're used. Uh, money, of course, is the universal reinforcer because it can be exchanged for any other type of reinforcer that's individually meaningful to the person. Of course, there are many problems uh, associated with just giving money to patients. So in the programs that, that I've been involved in that do use any form of money, uh, it usually is in the form of a debit card where funds are added to it when the target behavior is reached. And there are very strategic limitations on how and where the debit card can be utilized um, to make sure that it's utilized for, for relatively innocuous or positive purposes. Uh, then, of course, there are tangible rewards. So that could be gift cards, vouchers that can be exchanged for meaningful items, other concrete items. Uh, and gift cards and vouchers work especially well with organizations who are utilizing community donations um, to help build up the, the resource bank. And then we'll talk briefly in a moment about um, tangible rewards that are won through a sort of um, a gamified system, so to speak, opportunity to win prizes or money. Uh, another form, and this is kind of the original older form, uh, is that uh, privileges are used as a reinforcer. Uh, probably a lot of people here are familiar with the idea of take-home doses of methadone being a reinforcer for negative UDSs, and that, that originated with those Rockefeller studies uh, in the 60s. Then there are also social reinforcements. That's not typically a part of a formal part of CM, uh, but it is a sort of informal part of the social architecture in which uh, CM is facilitated. Uh, and you can see some more social reinforcements in, for example, 12 step groups where there's often a version of a, a chip or you know, some kind of physical recognition of a certain interval of abstinence. And it's introduced with a ceremony and accolades, uh, this sort of social approbation from, um, from peers. So a couple of concepts with, with how you build appropriate reinforcements are that you want to make sure that the reinforcer value increases in proportion to the target behavior maintenance. And what that means is that you want to make sure that if the target behavior is abstinence as measured by negative UDSs, that the reward for that is bigger when it's been, say, five weeks of consecutive negative UDSs than the reward for one week of uh, negative UDS, because it's really important that uh, the person doesn't habituate, right, doesn't sort of get desensitized or used to it, and that they recognize the value of sustaining those health-promoting behaviors. Uh, you do want the reinforcer to be previously defined in the sense that you want to make sure that people aren't disappointed with the options. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't be disappointed if it's a sort of more of a lottery system with what they end up with, but you do want to make sure they know ahead of time what the options are. And that goes to the importance of selecting salient reinforcers because one of the things that we found in the research is that providers are surprisingly out what uh, meaningful reinforcers are going to be for patients. It's really, really important to ask the patient population directly about this. I've been really surprised at how popular bus passes are, for example, and uh, very poignantly, I've seen a lot of adult patients work very, very hard towards uh, getting toys for their children. 
as far as uh, tangible reinforcers. So again, very important to make sure that you're getting reinforcers that are meaningful to the community that you're working with. Uh, so this is that kind of caveat to the um, what we would generally say is the importance of consistency and reinforcement. Uh, this is a technique that Dr. Petrie at the University of Connecticut developed uh, in trying to dis, uh, find just low, lower cost ways to deliver these services. And this is just an elegantly brilliant solution. Uh, she drew on the, the power of intermittent reinforcement, which we won't dive into, the, into all the details of it today. Uh, but what we know from behaviorism is that intermittent reinforcement uh, keeps people uh, engaged with the reinforcer for longer, um, partly because of the sort of sense of anticipation of not knowing exactly when or what the reinforcer will be. I've had oh, this. this I, I I just want to respond to some of the comments in the chat, um, and and specifically um, about the funding or or the challenges in getting this funded. So I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat, but I think this is a point where we start writing our senators or our congressional people. Um, and and here's why. So NIDA has, who is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, who funds, is with NIH and funds a lot of the, all the drug research. Nora Volklau, who is the managing director, has come out and said in no uncertain terms um, that for not, it would be a waste of our resources to fund additional contingency management resources, amongst with other basic things like having naloxone available, saving lives, having MOUD available. I mean, very, very basic stuff. Um, and I'll put a link to that letter in the chat. CMS or Medicaid does not reimburse um, for contingency management at this time. And in my opinion, what needs to happen is um, NIDA and CMS needs to have a sit down and have a discussion on, you know, what it would take for CMS to cover contingency management. I mean, if there's more research or more that something's needed, they should, but to deny an evidence-based treatment approach, um, to me, I think is is really not, not what CMS or anybody is about. Um, the other is the American College or American Society of Addiction Medicine has a statement um, that they released last fall regarding um, stimulant use disorder. And um, in that, they specifically highlight the need for contingency management is, is our, really our best line. Um, and in the ASAM um, statement, position statement, they, all, they go on so far to point out um, non-FDA approved tr drug treatment options with the one that they cite as the best evidence is costing well over a thousand dollars a month, realistically 1500 to 2000 dollars a month. And again, spending that much money on a non-FDA approved when you've got something that works even better um, for a tenth of the price to me boggles my mind. So I'll put those links in the chat, I personally spoke to um, one of the representatives from Senator Heinrich's office last week on the on this ex um, specific specifically on this issue of amongst a few other things. So they're starting to hear it, and you won't be the only one. But I think beginning to ask um, for us to have some tools, especially for stimulant use disorder. Wow. Uh, so yeah, just wrapping up with the fishbowl technique, uh, the idea is that there's a range of different options and that uh, the patients who meet the target behaviors can um, uh, draw for them every time. And if they are meeting consecutive target behaviors, they can draw multiple times. So they have a better chance of getting one of the jumbo prizes, which is very desirable. Uh, this is particularly helpful because so many of these patients have impulsive tendencies and this approach works really well. It's almost um, it's almost like a sort of benign gambling system in a way, and that it keeps the anticipation up. So that's really helpful, and patients get very uh, invested in it. Uh, in terms of target behaviors, uh, negative urine drug screens are the classics. Uh, you could also target medication adherence or treatment attendance, and really a very wide range of therapeutic and health promoting goals. Uh, this is effective with dual diagnosis populations. And treatment retention is a great secondary benefit because patients tend to be very invested in the state for a long time because they, they want to see what they're able to get uh, when they stick to the target behaviors. 
Uh, so this is a, a story that Dr. Petru shared about, um, you know, the success of this activity contracting approach. So she says, we had one patient who had lost contact with his adult son and had grandkids he had never met. One week, he said he wanted to reestablish contact with his son. He wrote a letter and brought in the letter as verification. We mailed it with him. So then he earned his draw from the fishbowl for completing that activity. The next week, he wanted to call his son. So we did that from our office. The next week, he met his son at a restaurant and brought back the receipt. After a couple of weeks, he got to meet the grandkids. And then for the rest of treatment, he would take the grandkids somewhere every Saturday morning. A year or so later, a research assistant ran into the former patient at an Easter egg hunt with his grandchildren. The man said that he was still taking his grandkids somewhere every Saturday morning and that this had kept him sober for nearly two years, well after completing treatment. This is a great example of the progression of activity contracting. The results are exactly what we hoped for. Uh, so I do want to wanted to share that qualitative piece because I think it can be easy to underestimate the value of those really small health promoting behaviors that you can start out with with CM. Uh, so in terms of integration with treatment, it is compatible with any type of evidence-based psychotherapy approach that establishes those verifiable goals uh, that you can apply the contingency management to. Uh, and of course, attendance or retention in treatment is one of the most basic ones, just uh, contingency management reinforcement for showing up at treatment. Uh, in terms of the best studied integrations uh, between CM and other forms of behavioral therapy, uh, the oldest is between community reinforcement approach, CRA, and the adolescent version of CRA, uh, and that's actually going back to the 80s, uh, what I mentioned with the crack cocaine epidemic. Uh, and CRA utilizes functional analysis, which helps patients to, to understand where their urges and cravings come from and how they're reinforced, uh, and combines that with skill building so that they're able to identify alternative and competing reinforcers, uh, so reinforcers that compete directly with substance use. Uh, and there's actually a therapy manual from the National Institute of Drug Abuse for CRA plus vouchers for cocaine dependence uh, back uh, from the 90s. It's that old. Uh, a much more recent one is IMPACT, which is a hybrid of motivational interviewing with acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is for adolescents with substance use disorders. Uh, and this actually has CM just built in from the ground up. Uh, it also uses, utilizes functional analysis and skill building based on individual values, uh, which is a great approach with teens. Uh, and they also use that fishbowl approach with the uh, funds added to a debit card um, when, when patients are able to uh, achieve a negative UDS. Uh, it, is, it is early on, but the preliminary evidence is really promising, uh, both in terms of uh, rates of abstinence that are impressive for this particular population, uh, as well as changes in clinical scores, so addressing those co-occurring issues. And also for this population, very high session rating scales, which indicates um, satisfaction with the therapy and therapist, which is a very good thing in terms of positive outcomes as well. So turning to organizational considerations uh, on implementation, uh, again, going back to that idea of the culture of affirmation, uh, these researchers note the people who run the system need to be very enthusiastic and friendly. That's again, that part of treating a population that's constantly in that uh, brain-based state of deprivation and making sure they're really feeling reinforced just for coming into the clinic. Uh, so that's about that treatment culture of affirmation. Uh, and some of the really interesting research on the organizational or higher level benefits from CM are that it really improves provider morale. Uh, we know that it improves participant morale, but uh, it was interesting to see that the organization as a whole benefited from the way that patients responded to CM. And this was particularly true for patients that had been in and out of treatment for a long time, and then suddenly they get traction with CM. And it turns out that that really helps uh, providers who might have been skeptical about CM really warm up to it because they see, well, if it works with this person who was really having difficulty engaging in treatment, you know, imagine the possibilities. Uh, the research also indicates that, you know, understandably, it, it improves group size uh, when, when attendance is rewarded, reinforced. Uh, but also, even when participation itself is not explicitly reinforced, the participation in group increases. Uh, so that's an interesting finding that seems to go along with the idea that morale in general is improved. Uh, and I know that the groups that I've participated in with CM people, the participants are very uh, invested in one another's progress, and they really support one another in, in getting those vouchers. Uh, so in terms of the science, and this is exactly what Dr. Warwick was pointing to before, I, I took this quote directly from uh, the director of National Dr uh, Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, which is in re reference to CM. In the science to medicine pipeline, there's a point when the evidence is so well established that to not put the science into action would be an abdication of responsibility. 
And again, as Dr. Warwick was referencing, that was in this uh, you know, piece where she was saying, we just don't need any more research, we know. <laughs> uh, so all the info that you might want is in this slide. I'll, I'll move ahead for time, but the, the idea is that you know, going back for about 20 years or more, we have plenty of evidence that this works really well and it works better for stimulant use disorder specifically than any other behavioral treatment that we have. In terms of logistical barriers to implementation, I think Dr. Warwick really went over this already for the most part. So I'll just say, yeah, those cost concerns are really an issue specifically with Medicaid. Uh, the research indicates that, uh, you know, if you don't, uh, if you're not able to reimburse enough, if the reinforcer was too low of a magnitude, it really significantly reduces the efficacy. Uh, we do know with the fishbowl technique uh, and other resourceful approaches like community donations, the costs can actually be minimized pretty effectively. But obviously, if Medicaid would be reimbursed effectively, that would be a game changer. Uh, there's also a lot of confusions. I, I suspect this is what Dr. Warwick was talking about before I got back on. There's this lack of clarity about what the regulations are, so organizations are understandably apprehensive about things like being accused of medical fraud or coercive incentivization. Totally understandable. It's really important that we have uh, clarity uh, uh, around what the regulations are because if CM is applied correctly, there's absolutely no danger whatsoever uh, of those infractions. Uh, and then lastly, on the logistical side, uh, it, effective training is really important because lack of awareness, uh, staff training, and the research to practice gap uh, particularly are areas where uh, you know, logistically things fall through when they could have been successfully implemented. Uh, on the ideological side, there are unfortunately a lot of negative community beliefs out there. Uh, some people feel that it's immoral to pay people who use substances for abstinence. Uh, in some especially traditional 12-step communities in the past, there's been a perception that contingency management doesn't really count as true recovery because it interferes with an individual's ability to identify their own individual motive. Um, so these are personal beliefs uh, from what I've heard. There's, there's been a shift recently with the 12-step groups, which is great to hear, and the, it overlaps significantly with some of those historical community attitudes towards medication for opioid use disorder. Then on the provider and administrator side, sometimes they have the negative attitudes towards incentivizing abstinence. Providers sometimes feel that this is not a bona fide treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, on the surface, it's very different from conventional psychotherapy approaches, so you can see where that comes from. Uh, but what we find is that providers and administrators who are exposed to training or even just getting to CCM in action, um, that significantly reduces those negative attitudes. And there is a particular program for light at all promoting awareness of the motivational incentives that uh, seems to just transform those negative attitudes. Uh, so it really seems it's mostly about people understanding what the system is and how it works. So this has been a lot. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me with the tech issues. The takeaways here are that CM is an effective treatment for multiple substance use disorders. It addresses a critical gap in effective treatment for stimulant use disorders. It operates according to fundamental behavioral principles of positive reinforcement to compete with substance use and behaviors. The evidence base is very robust and includes decades of refinement across various settings. It can be integrated with other evidence-based treatments and applied to versatile therapeutic and health promoting goals and increased regulatory clarity and exposure to education about CM are key to overcoming those implementation barriers. 